today we're going to be going over more contro control structures. Now again, it's just one of those things where we have to get through the syntax of C-sharp before we can get on some more of the more advanced concepts. So let's just go ahead and jump right in. For this figure in 6.5, we're first going to kind of learn about for statements. Now, one of the things about Visual Studio that I want you to remember is that there's these things called code snippets. And so as you start typing, you can see some of them will come up. And for instance, there's a code snippet for the for statement. And so if I type for and press tab tab, you can see it actually inserts the syntax of a for loop for me. Now what's nice about this is there's lots of different, even for an if statement, that I can have these code snippets, or a while statement. Now what's nice about these is that there's a lot of times where it just fills in the syntax for you so you don't have to think and it's just a lot less typing. So let's show you that one more time. So let's go for tab tab and you notice the first thing that it does is it actually highlights this variable here saying that if you wanted to change it you could. I could just press that and then press tab and it'll actually jump me to this next variable. I could change it to something like 10 and you can see how it's changed it. And so that's what the tabs do. It just kind of jumps back and forth. Like, less that you have to take your hands off the keyboard. Now in our for statement here, the first thing we have is the initialization. And this is pretty typical of what you'll see in a for statement. Now you're going to have multiple variables in here, but typically you have one. So this is where we're going to actually create our variable. Here we're going to say, I want you to continue to do the loop until this statement is false. So this is going to continue to loop as long as j is less than 10. So in this instance, we're actually going to loop 10 times because we started at 0. Or another way you could have written this would be something like this if you wanted it to run it 10 times. Then the lastly is just the increment or decrement. So this is the post-processing where we're going to check this, but then we're going to increment this. So let's take a look at an example here from the book. And what we're, they're doing is this for statement. They've set this number to 2. To begin with, again, you can set that to anything you want. The vast majority of the time we set it to zero, but not always. Here's our condition statement. So we're going to do this as long as that number is less than 20. And then each time we're actually going to increment it by two. And as long as this condition is true, we're going to continue to print this out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go ahead and set a quit breakpoint here. Let's go ahead and run the code. We can see now that as it runs, it's going to hit this breakpoint. And we can actually, I'm going to do F10. You can see the first thing it does is initialize that variable. Then it's going to test this condition. And it comes down here, it executes the code, and then it increments the number, and then it comes back and tests the condition again. And it'll just continue to do that over and over again until that condition's false. Then it'll break out of this loop and go move on. So that's the basics of a for statement. I don't think that should be anything new, but again, we had to take a look at it for the syntax of C sharp. So this next program, this is in figure 6.6, .6, and what it does is we got another for loop that we just learned about, but there's something new inside here, and that's the math class. And so if you say math dot, you'll notice that this class is used to set up just a whole bunch of basic sort of math functions, like the absolute value, or sine, or cosine, or exponents, floor, ceiling, the max, the min. And so this is just a kind of a, a great class to have in your back pocket that you know about, so that you can get the max of mal, max or the min, you know, and all these different things. You just kind of get that code for free using the math class. So make sure you're aware of that and, and how to use it. So the next thing I want to talk about is just how you format some strings. And so, again, there, there's lots of different ways to do this, but this is kind of the way I tend to do it, where if I'm going to format a string to a certain format, I use the string.format method here. And in this case, let's say we want to actually print out this number, but we only want to print it out to two decimal places. So that's what this syntax is used for here. Honestly, I, for, I do this so rare that I forget about it too. So a lot of times I have to look it up. So if you don't have these sort of things memorized, don't worry about it. You do it so rarely, you just you know look it up on the internet and you figure it out again. Essentially just saying, hey, I want to create this float with two decimal places beyond it. Another one you could do is currency. So this is how this number would print out if you did this particular string dot format for this number. So the next one is a do while loop. So the reason you'd want to use a do while loop is that if you always want this to execute at least one time. So it says do this code, then check your Boolean statement here. 
And so you'll always guarantee this will execute one time, then test your condition, and then it'll move on there. So it's just a little bit different than like a while loop or for loop. So next here we've got this gradebook program. This is in figure 6.9. So this is going to be calculating some grades for us that the user can input. And we just read in a grade from the console here. Now the way we enter these grades is you enter a number, let's say 95. And so what they're doing is, is this reads in that grade here. So we've got this input from the user. Let's pretend they entered in, you know, 95. So now our grade of 95 is right here. And you can see that it keeps continually adds that to the total. But let's just focus on the 95 for right now. We're going to come down here into this switch statement. Now again, if I start typing switch and press tab tab, you can see that there is my syntax for how to do that. Now a switch is just like an if statement, a whole bunch of if else statements. So in this case, what they're saying is, is that grade divided by 10. So remember, this is integer division. So if I highlight grade, you can see it's an integer and we're dividing by another integer. So if you had entered a grade of 95, so 95 divided by 10, now because it's an integer, all it's going to return you is 9 in this particular case. So this case is what's going to get executed and it's going to increment A's. If you'd entered 81, it would return 8 and it would go out this break statement here. So that's the key thing to remember on the switch statements here is that you can see that the code will actually fall through. So if it's any 9, it'll actually 9 or 10 will run this code and then break out. So that's why that break statement is so important so that it doesn't actually fall through from one case to the other. And then at the end there's this default statement. So if any of these are false, this is basically your else path where you can just say, hey, if any grade was below 60, then increment this one up here. So very typical usage of a switch statement. This next program in figure 613, we've got a for statement, but there's a lot of times that you know we've, we're looking for something. We're looping through an array or some set of values, and sometimes we only want that one value. We're going to manipulate it, and then that's all we care about. And so what you can do is you can actually use this break statement, and look what happens when I highlight it. You can see that it actually tells you which loop it's actually breaking out of. Because remember, you could have nested loops. And so what's kind of nice about Visual Studio is it kind of tells you where this break is actually associated with. Now this is very common in a lot of the work that I do because I may be actually looking through massive amounts of uh, data sets. That could be thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of items. And I'm just looking for one particular value or one or the first value that meets a certain set of criteria. So if I find that after 100 values, I find the value I'm looking for, I don't want to continue to waste my CPU and you know keep looking through hundreds of thousands of records if I've already found the one I want. So you might as well just break out and then execute the code that you want to do. Now, very similar to that, and here in figure 6.14, we've got our for loop. But now we found some sort of condition and we want to do something. You know, we want to, we're, we're looking for, we have a thousand elements, we're going to look through them all. And every time we find a condition, maybe we want to save away that object or save away that value, something like that. And if you want to do that, but you're still looking through every single for loop, you can do continue. So maybe there's a, a bunch of extra code that you don't want it to execute down here if it's this value. So you're saying, don't execute this code down here, but hey, I still want you to come back up to this for loop. So again, if you found some magic value that you're looking for, you could you could assign it somewhere else and then say continue so it just goes up here and it skips the rest of this code down here. Next, I want to come back to our program that we've looked at a little bit before, this chapter 5 and 6, six example program. And we're going to look a little bit more at the rest of this code where we enter a number, click this button, we're going to put some stuff to this rich text box here. And we've also got this image that's going to help you with your assignment number 2 this code here. So if we come in here, this is just kind of what we showed before. So we've got our for loop. We're going to loop through this 10 times and just print out the value to our rich text box while putting a new line on each one. This is just showing you again the string dot format for currency and the floating point that we just learned. Now here, this is a slightly different concept where we've, we've seen if statements before, but now we've got these compound statements where we have this two booleans within it. In C-sharp, you have the AND statement, 
and you have the or statement. So that's how you would and or or these booleans together, which you'd have to use the, the boolean or or truth table to figure out if this is going to be true or false. So in this case, if j equals 3 or k equals 4, it's going to execute here, where here we're using an and statement, j equals 4 and k equals 5 in order for us to be able to execute this one. So you just need to be aware of that. Um, there's also, for instance, the not operator. So this takes this statement and just reverses whatever Boolean it is. If it's true, it'll move it to false. If it's false, it'll move it to true, which sometimes we want to do. Another one is the exclusive or statement, which only returns, only returns true if both conditions are different values. So this one has to be true, and this one has to be false, or this one has to be false, and this one has to be true in order for that statement to be executed as true. Now the next thing we want to talk about is how we can change the dice image here for our assignment and that's this code here. Now what we're doing here is we're just saying stretch the image. Now normally you would just do this as far as the property right here you could just set that value here but we can also do it dynamically in the code. Then we've got a for statement that's going to loop through. Now we've got six different dice so that's why we're going from one to six here. We've got this image control and we're going to set its image property and you can see it takes an image value so that's why we have this image class that we can use if I highlight you can see it's in the system.drawing.image so if we were to scroll all the way to the top you can see system.drawing we use this namespace because we didn't want to have to draw type out system.drawing every single time we want to use this image class from file so this is just a method that's just saying, hey, I'm going to try to get this image from this file. And we're going to say particular dice image that we want. And you notice, so this is going to be dice 1, and then 2, and then 3, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in order for this to work, in this debug folder, you have to have these at the same place that you have this exe for this to work, if you're going to use this relative path. So, And that's generally what you're going to want to do. So and if it was in a subfolder or something like that, you'd have to add on the path here. But this gives us the image from our file. Now, we're going to learn more about threading later on. But right now, we're just going to keep it simple. And this essentially says, hey, just refresh the image on the UI. And now put this thread to sleep for 300 milliseconds. Essentially, just pause. So you know, display the image one, actually display it, pause for just a little bit. OK, now display the next image update it, and then pause. From there, let's go ahead and now run our application. We can take a look at everything that it outputs. So we'll come in here, click 3, which doesn't really matter. And you can see here's those formats that we learned about. And then here's the numbers that you can see incrementing 1 to 6. So again, we have, we're refreshing our UI, and we're displaying each of the images as it goes through here. So hopefully that all made sense.